If, on the contrary, we spread hominid phylogeny out along a more appropriate time scale, training our attention on what seems to have happened in the human line since the radiation of the hominoids, and in particular since the emergence of the Australopithecus, Australopithecus toward the end of the Pliocene, a subtler analysis of the evolutionary growth of mind is made possible. Most crucially, it, it then becomes ap apparent that not only was cultural accumulation underway well before organic development ceased, but that such accumulation very likely played an active role in shaping the final stages of that development. Though it is apparently true enough that the invention of the airplane led to no visible bodily changes, no alterations or innate mental capacity, this was not necessarily the case for the pleb tools or the road crude chopper, chopper in whose wick in whose wax seems to have come not only more erect stature reduced the dent dentition and a more thumb dominated hand, but the expansion of the human brain to its present size, because tool manufacture puts a premium on manual skills and for foresight is introduction must have acted to shift selection pressures so as to favor the rapid growth of the forebrain as in all likelihood did the advances in social organization, communication and moral regulation which there is reason to believe also occurred during this period of overlap between cultural and biological change. Nor were such nervous system changes merely quantitative alterations in the interconnections among neurons and their manner of functioning may have been or even greater importance than the simple increase in their, in their number. The tail aside, however, and the bulk of them, and the bulk of them remains to be determined. The point is that the in, in, innate generic constitution of modern man, what of what uses in a simple in the simpler day, to be called human nature, now appears to be both a casual, a casual, a cultural and a biological product in that it is probably more correct to think of much of our structure as a result of culture rather than to think of men anatomically like ourselves slowly discovering culture. The Pleistocene, Pleistocene period, with its rapids and radical variation in climate and land formations and vegetations, has long been recognized to be a period in which conditions were ideal for the speedy and efficient evolutionary development of man. How it seems also to have been a period in which a cultural environment incre increasingly supplemented the natural environment in the selection process to us to further further accelerate the rate of how many evolution to an unprecedented speed. The Ice Age appears not to have been merely a time of rescinding brow rages and shrinking jaws, but a time in which we forget nearly all those characteristics of man's ex existence which are most graphically human. His thoroughly encephal encephalated nervous system, his incest taboo based social structure and his capacity to create and use symbols. The fact that these distinctive features of humanity emerge together in complex in interaction with one another rather than the serially of as for so long supposed is of, of exceptional importance in the interpretation of human mentality 
because it suggests that man's nervous system does not, mer does not merely enable him to acquire culture. Is it posit positively demands that he do so if it is going to function at all, rather than culture acting only to supplement, develop, develop and extend organically based capacity logically and genetically prior to, he, to it. It will seem to be ingredient to those capacity, capacities themselves. A cultureless human being will probably turn out to be not that intrinsically talented through unf unfulfilled day, but a wholly mindless and consequently unworkable com monstrosity. Like the cabbage, it is like the cabbage. It it so much resembles the Homo sapiens brain, having arisen with within the framework of human culture, will not be viable outside of it. In fact, this type of reciprocally creative relationship between somatic and extrasomatic phenomena seems to have been of crucial significance during the whole of the primate advance that any living or extinct living or extinct infrahominid primates can be said to possess true culture in the narrowest sense of an ordered system of meaning and symbols in terms of which individuals define their world, express their feelings, and make their judgments. It's of course extremely doubtful, but that apes and monkeys are such true and true social creatures as to be unable to achieve emotional maturity in isolation, to acquire a great many of their most important performance capacity through imita imit imitative learning and to develop distinctive intra-specifically in, intra, intra variable collective social traditions which are transmitted as a non-biological heritage from, generations to, to, from generation to generation is now well established. As Devor remarks in summary of the available material, primate Primates literally have a social brain, thus well before it was influenced by cultural forces as such. The evolution of what eventually developed into the human nervous system was posi positively shaped by social ones. On the other hand, however, a denial of a simple independence of sociocultural and biological processes in the pre-homo sapiens, man, man does not imply a rejection of the doctrine of physic unity, because philetic differentiation within the hominid line effectively sees it with the terminal Pleistocene spread of homo sapiens over nearly the whole world and the extinction of whatever other homo, homo species may have been in, ex in existence at the time. Those are those some minor revolutionary changes have no doubt occurred since the rise of modern man. All living peoples from form part of a single polytypical species and as such vary anatomically and phy physiologically within a very narrow range. The combination of weakened mechanisms of rep reproductive isolation and extended period of individual sexual immaturity and the accumulation of culture to the point where its, important, its importance as an adaptive factor almost wholly dominated its role as a selective one produced such a, an extreme a de deceleration of the hominid rate of evolution that the development of any significant variation in innate, innate mental capacity among human subgroups seems to have been preclude, precluded. With the unequivocal triumph of Homo sapiens and the cessation of the glaciations, the link between organic and cultural change was, if not severed, at least greatly weakened. 
since that since that time organic evolution in the human line has slowed to walk while the growth of culture had continued to proceed with ever increasing rapid rapidity it is therefore necessary to postulate either a discontinuous difference in in kind difference in kind pattern of human evolution or a non-selective role for culture during all phases of hominid development in order to preserve the empirically established generalization that as far as their inborn capacity to learn, maintain, transmit and transform culture is concerned different groups of homo sapiens must be regarded as equally competent. Psychic Psychic unity may no longer be tautology, but it is it is still a fact. Three. One of the more encouraging, if strangely delayed, developments in the behavioral science is the current attempt of physiological psychology to arouse itself from its long and entrailment with the wonders of the reflex arc. The conventional picture of a sensory impulse making its way through a maze of synapses to a motor nerve culmination is coming to be revised. A quarter century after its most il illust illustrious proponents pointed out that it was in the inadequate to explain the integrative aspects of the behavior of a sparrow of a or a sheep dog, much less, much less of that of a of, of a man. Sheringstone's solution was a spectral mind to pull things together, as whose was no less mysterious automatic switchboard. But today the stress is upon a more variable, very ver verifiable construct, the concept of rhythmic, spontaneous, centrally proceeding. Patterns of nervous activity upon which peripheral stimulus configuration are superimposed and out of which authoritative ef effectors commands emerge. Advancing under the banner of an active organism and supported by the closed circuit anatomizing both Kayal and Denot. This new persuasion emphasizes the way in which the ongoing processes, both of the brain and subordinate neuronal aggregates, select pre precepts, fixed experiences, and order responses so as to produce a delicately modulated pattern of behavior. The working of the central nervous system is a hierarchical affair in which functions at the higher levels do not deal directly with the ultimate structural units, such as neurons or motor units, but operate by ac ac activating lower patterns that have their own relatively autonomous structural unity. The same is true for the sensory input, which does not project itself down the last final path of modern nervous but operates by affecting the distors distort this distorting and somehow modifying the pre existing performer patterns of central coordination which in turn then confer confer their directions upon the lower patterns of affections and so on. The final output in the in the, is then the outcome of this hierarchical passing down of distortions and modification, modifications of intrinsically performed pattern, patterns of excitation which are no way replicants of the input. The structure of the input does not produce the structure of the output, but merely modifies in intrinsic nervous activities that have a structural organization of their own. Further development of this theory of an autonomously excited, hierarchically organized central nervous system, Donos, 
not only promises to make the breeze comp competence of Sherrington's sheep dog as it collects its scattered flock from the hillside less of a psychology physiological mystery, but it should also prove valuable in providing a credible neurological underpinning for the complex of skills and propensities which constitute the human mind. The ability to follow a logical proof or a tendency to become frustrated when called upon to speak demand more than a reflect arc, conditioned or otherwise to support them biologically. And as Hebb has pointed out, the very notion of higher and lower evolutionary levels of mentality seems it in itself to imply a comparable gradation in degree of central nervous system and anatomy. I hope do not shock biological scientists by saving that one feature of the phylogenetic development, devo development is an increasing evidence of what is known in some circles as free will. In my student days also referred to as the Harvard Law, which asserts that any well-trained experimental animal on controlled simulation will do as he damn well places. He, he do as he damn well pl pleases. A more scholarly formulation is that the higher animal is less stimulus bound. Brain function, brain action is less fully controlled by a third input, behavior therefore less fully predictable from the situation in which the animal is put. A greater role of ideational activity is recognizable in the animal's ability to hold a variety of stimulations for some time before acting on the on them and in the phenomenon of persuasive behavior. There is more autonomous activity in the higher brain and more selectivity as to which afferent activity will be integrated with the stream of thought. The dominant ongoing activity is control of behavior, in control of behavior. Traditionally, we say that the subject is interested in this part of the environment, not interested in that. In these terms, the higher animal has a wider variety of interests, and the interest of the moment plays a greater part in behavior, which means a greater unpredictability as to what stimulus will be responded and responded to and as to the form of the response. These overall evolutionary trends, increasing ability to focus attention, delay response, vary interests, sustain, pur su sustain purpose, and in general, deal positively with the complexities of present, st of present stimulation, culminating men to make of him the most active of active organisms, as well as the most unpredictable, the extreme, in, the extreme intricacy, flexibility, and comprehen comprehensiveness of what Gluckholm and Murray have ap applied called Rignan re processes in the human brain. The processes which make these abilities physically possible are but the outcome of a deniable phylogenetic development which is traceable back at least to the coelenratis, co co though they lack a central nervous con con concentration, a brain and therefore the various parts of the animal operate in relative independence, each possessing its own set of sensory, neural, and motor elements. These humble jellyfish, sea anemones, and the like never, nevertheless show a surprising degree of intrinsic modulation of nervous activity a strong stimulus received in the daytime may be followed by locomotion during the following night, 
certain coral is experimentally subjected to excessive stimulation luminescence for several minutes afterward with a spontaneous frenzy which suggests berserking and regular, regular, regularis, regularized stimulation may lead through some still obscure form of memory to a coordination of activity in different muscles and to a pattern recurrence recurrence of activity over time in the higher invertebrates, crustaceans, etc. Multiple pathways, graded synaptic potentials and triggered responses all appear, permitting precise pacemaker control of internal function as in the lobster heart, the lobster heart, while with the arrival of the lower vertebrates, both peripheral sensory and effector elements and neuron, neuronal condu conduction between them. The celebrated reflect art are essential, are essential, are essential, essentially perfected. And finally, the bulk of the fundamental innovations in the design of nervous circuits, closed loops, the superposition of higher level loops, of lower ones, and so on, probably were accomplished with the arrival of the mammals, at which time at least the basic differ differ differentiations of the forebrain were also achieved. In functional terms, the whole process seems to be one of the relatively steady expansions and diversification of endogenous nervous activity and the consequent, the consequent increase in centralization of what were previously more isolated, independently, independently acting part processes.